I built this device to connect my Game Boy to the internet. Why? So I can play tic-tac-toe, of course. Just plug the device into the Game Boy, insert the custom cartridge, and attach the very reasonably sized battery pack, and you are good to go. You are finally free to explore the internet through the comfort of your crusty old Game Boy Color. But why did I make this? Good question. I don't really know at this point. So let's start from the beginning. Last year, I stumbled across a video of a guy modifying a Game Boy Color. I, of course, immediately went and bought one on Facebook Marketplace for 50 bucks. A few weeks later, and some more money down the drain, I now had a nicely modded Game Boy Color. But I was left with a dilemma. I was not going to be using it to play games a whole lot. So I had to find some other use for it to justify my purchase. And doing a project with it sounded like the reasonable choice. But what kind of project should I do? And as I fell ever deeper into the Game Boy rabbit hole, I made a discovery which cracked it for me. Game Boy Color. The Mobile Game Boy Adapter, a Japan-only Game Boy accessory which was released in 2001. This ancient piece of tech allowed anyone with a compatible mobile phone to connect their Game Boy to the internet. The moment I found out about this, the project was set in stone. I had to replicate this with modern technology. Entirely unfazed by the fact that I had never done anything like this in the past, I began working on it immediately. Like most people, I have a track record of not finishing my projects. I seem to naturally jump around from project to project like some sort of manic kangaroo. And as such, my aim with this project was actually just to finish something, literally anything. So to make the project more digestible, I split it into two parts. The actual NetBoy's device hardware and software, which handled communication to and from the Game Boy, and the custom Game Boy game and its server, so we actually have something to use the device for. We will start by making the actual NetBoy device. And the requirements for said device may seem a bit daunting at first glance, as it has to be able to communicate with the Game Boy, and handle a Wi-Fi connection at the same time. And we'll explain exactly how we're going to be doing this in just a moment. But we have an issue. Where would I even start looking for hardware, which is able to handle such a project? With zero experience in anything to do with electronics and embedded programming, it's not like I would be able to design my own PCBs, at least not at this time. Thankfully, I'm not the only nerd who wants to make useless Wi-Fi enabled devices. So let me introduce you to the ESP32. This right here is a bog standard ESP32 development board. You can buy one on Amazon for less than 10 bucks. And this little thing will be the brains of our device. But how will we connect this to a Game Boy? I wanted this device to be fully functional on any old Game Boy Color. And as such, I wanted to avoid any modifications to the Game Boy itself being necessary for the device to function. So to facilitate communication between the ESP32 and the Game Boy, we will be using the Link port on the Game Boy Color. To you, the viewer, it most likely only ever served as a means to trade Pokemon with friends. But for this project, it is the key to everything, as it's basically just a normal serial connection. That means that we're sending one byte of data at a time in a series, literally bit by bit. This does not result in a very fast connection reaching a maximum of 512 kilobits per second on a Game Boy Color. This may sound slow to our modern standards, but for our purposes, it is plenty fast enough. And since it allows for literally any binary data to be sent, we can do whatever we want with it. So all we have to do is simply cut an old link cable in half, strip it and reveal the wires, find the brown, blue and green wires. We then solder them onto any available pins on the ESP32. And with that, we're good to go with the hardware. There really isn't anything else necessary for this project. We can now move on to the hard part, the software. But this is where I began to run into some problems. So before we get into that, let me explain how we're actually going to be formatting the data we will be sending between the Netboy and the Game Boy. 
they will need to share a common communications protocol to ensure they speak the same language. This is what I came up with. We start by having a message identification header. This is made up of two bytes, which in hexadecimal would be A, B, and C, D. This is used to detect the start of a new message when we're listening to the stream of incoming bytes. We then have two bytes that make up a 16-bit number, which is the total length of the entire message. We then have one byte, which signifies what type of message we're sending. I added this to lessen the amount of data sent per message. With this, we can simply state that we're sending a Wi-Fi password, and as such, the only actual data in the payload is the password string. The rest is handled on device. We then have set aside another two bytes for a 16-bit number, which signifies the place in a greater message sequence order, which this message may be a part of. Although this was never used for this project. We then reach the meat and potatoes of the actual message, the actual payload data, which is used however we want on the device based on the message type specified earlier. And then finally, we have an extra two byte checksum to ensure that the message was sent correctly and didn't get corrupted along the way. With this system implemented on both the Netboy device and on the custom Game Boy game, we can confidently exchange messages, ensuring that the data transmitted is accurate. Now let's jump into how we actually send and receive these messages. As I mentioned earlier, this is where I ran into some challenges. So I need to include a quick disclaimer. From this point forward, the methods which I used aren't what I'd call best practice. While I learned a lot from this process personally, the solutions I came up with in the end are somewhat flawed, so I wouldn't recommend replicating them as is. Now that I've lowered your expectations, let's begin by setting up a test cartridge to check if we are sending bytes to and from the Game Boy and Netboy correctly. Thankfully, this was straightforward, as the GBDK 2020 framework includes an example program that handles basic byte sending and receiving. I used it out of the box and it worked perfectly. Now on the Netboy device, I've set up an interrupt to monitor any change on the pin where we solder the clock wire from the link cable. Whenever the Game Boy sends a byte, it triggers the clock pin once for each bit in the byte. Each time a change in the clock signal is detected by our interrupt, we read and store the current state of the out pin. The Game Boy sends bits by either pulling the out pin up to signify a one or keeping it pulled down to signify a zero. After detecting eight clock ticks from the clock pin, we can register this as a complete byte. I keep a buffer of the last two bytes received on either end, and after each byte has been read, I check to see if the last bytes match our message header. If a new message header is detected, I begin reading the incoming bytes into a new buffer until the total number of read bytes matches the encoded message length which is included in the message. Now with a complete message received, I check the encoded message type, which then dictates what the actual payload will be used for. And that's mostly it. But with this, we can do essentially anything, since we are now freely able to send data to and from the Game Boy. Before we move on, I want to reiterate that although this sounds like a very reasonable and straightforward solution, it took me at least six months of procrastinating and debugging to, for one, figure out what to do, and secondly, to actually make it work. As an example to illustrate how this entire project took so long, I spent at least two weeks trying to figure out why all my incoming bytes were being read as the maximum value of 255. I then figured out that all I had to do was add a resistor to the out pin I was reading from. For some, this might not be so obvious. It sure as hell wasn't for me at the time. But for someone with even a smidge of electronics experience, this would have been the obvious first thing to check. But I had never had to solve such an issue before, and I wouldn't even have known where to start looking at the time. I got so desperate that in the end, I asked ChatGPT for some help, and that is what finally cracked it when it mentioned trying adding a 10K resistor. I will skip all the boring stuff, and we can move on to what am I actually going to be using this for? Up until this point, all I had been doing is sending random bytes back and forth. So I wanted to do something fun with it. Maybe a little web browser or a chat room. I had a boatload of ideas. I then looked at the calendar and realized that I had been working on this project for way too long. So I decided I was going to make the simplest game I could think of. Tic-tac-toe. And I actually began by making a version of Tic-Tac-Toe for 
Android using the Unity game engine, which took no time at all as it is my day job after all. With the Android version finished, I moved on to creating the server, which would handle the game logic for the tic-tac-toe game. And on the surface, this should have been simple, if not even simpler than making the Unity client. But I made the mistake of initially trying to write the server in Rust, a language I at that point was almost entirely unfamiliar with. This ended in complete disaster, as all I was left with after a bit too long was an unruly mess that worked sometimes. So after a while, I decided to finally switch and wrote a new server in C Sharp from scratch. I then had a running version working in a few days. Now it's time to make the final piece of the puzzle, the actual Game Boy version. But at this point of the project, it was actually not too much of a problem. I simply replicated what I'd implemented on the Netboy device. And after having one annoying struggle where I was unable to get my sprites to render properly, I had a pretty nicely polished and, most importantly, functional multiplayer Game Boy game, which I can proudly show to you now. So, after 12 months of ups, downs, and a lot of aha moments, we now have a Game Boy that actually connects to the internet. All of this just to play a game of tic-tac-toe. It may seem like a massively over-engineered solution for such a simple outcome, but for me, the project has been so much more than the tic-tac-toe game itself. I learned an incredible amount, but maybe most importantly, I believe I achieved the most important goal which I had set for myself at the beginning of this project. I finally finished a project, a pretty big one at that. And one of the biggest takeaways for me is how crucial it was to break this project down into smaller, manageable pieces. Looking back, I realized I could have saved myself a lot of headaches if I'd spent a bit more time researching before jumping in. For example, having a basic understanding of electronics and hardware would have saved me weeks of troubleshooting. But all in all, I think I did pretty good. Going forward, I am going to approach my project with a bit more structure. I realized that taking on everything at the same time, trying to figure out things as I go, probably dragged this project out over a year, even though it was a tough journey. I'm glad I stuck with it. Honestly, what I really wanted to get out of this project was not something useful or a certain set of skills. Although I am happy to know that I have learned an immense amount through this project. What I really was looking for was to prove to myself that I could finish something ambitious, new and unknown. And in that case, I achieved my goal perfectly. I would have hoped I had it finished a bit earlier, but shit happens. The next one will be finished a bit quicker, hopefully. Thanks for watching.